Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at a few of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming April of 2018 Premier Firearms Auction. And today we're taking a look at the really cool result of the BATF changing their mind, but then actually grandfathering something. This is what's called a G-Series FAL. And this is, well, this is a good example of some of the changes in legal definition of machine guns over the last many decades in the United States. So, uh, the FAL was, of course, developed uh, in Belgium by FN in the 1950s. It was widely adopted, so widely that it's become known as the right arm of the free world. Uh, it, basically, it and the HKG-3 are the two most prevalent 7.62 NATO combat rifles ever used in the world. So, of course, they're pretty popular guns. If you have a military, a modern military firearms collection, this is an important part of it, or the FAL is an important part of it. Now, the first company to import FALs to the United States was the Browning Arms Company. They bought rifles from FN directly. And this was the first time FN had been selling commercial FALs in the United States. And so, well, because of our laws, they needed a semi-auto version that wouldn't trigger the NFA. So they made the semi-auto FAL the same way that they made semi-auto military FALs, which, by the way, were a reasonably common thing. The British, for example, uh, they weren't buying their guns from FN, but the British military FAL, or as they called it, the SLR, uh, was semi-automatic only because this isn't all that practical of a gun to actually use in full auto from the shoulder. There were heavy barreled versions with bipods. Those are much better, much more practical for use in fully automatic, but not this version. So uh, the way that they made that change was basically to put on a selector lever that was blocked from going to the full auto position, and they left out the automatic sear or the safety sear. It holds the hammer back until the bolt is fully closed, and then something mechanical in the action trips it, and then it releases the hammer to fire automatically. The difference between, well, if you don't have that part, what happens is as the bolt goes forward, the hammer follows the bolt uh, traveling forward, and usually that means that the hammer doesn't have enough uh, force to actually detonate a primer when it's fully closed. Or, if the gun's designed very poorly, it will detonate the cartridge before the bolt is all the way locked and it'll fire out a battery and basically explode. So virtually all versions of select fire guns have some sort of automatic sear or safety sear that does that, that uh, ensures that the hammer comes back, gets caught, and then the bolt has enough time to travel forward, lock, and then the hammer is released to fire. So what FN did for semi-automatic fouls was just leave that part out and disable the function of the selector so you couldn't move it to full auto thinking it would do something. Um, in fact, if you did, like if you over ground off part of the sear, part of the selector and just flipped it all the way forward to auto, it would still fire semi-auto. Uh, and without adding in the proper parts, if someone tried to convert this to full auto, they would get hammer follow and it would not be a reliably functioning gun. So. I'm getting a little long-winded here, but that's the status of the guns that Browning, the Browning Arms Company, was importing into the U.S. starting in 1959, so really early. They would continue to import those guns until January 10th, 1963. And there actually is a letter that's available on the net from ATF discussing this exact thing dated 1961, where, of course, Browning had to submit one of these rifles to ATF for, their, for them to determine whether or not it would be a machine gun. And they looked at it and they said, well, you know, the, the automatic sear is not there, you can't move the selector forward. This looks good, you know, this is a semi-automatic gun. They recommended that FN also, or Browning, also completely remove the A, uh, the full auto marking from the receiver, just as a way to further uh, prevent people from getting the idea of converting them, but they didn't require that to be done. Uh, and in fact, to this day, semi-auto fouls pretty much all have the, the A, uh, full auto marking on the receivers. Nobody really cares about that because if it's not actually functional, it doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, in 63, ATF changed their opinion on what constituted a machine gun. And under this new opinion, basically the existing foul design was too easy to convert into full auto because the receiver, the lower, was machined with, well, the upper and the lower, were machined for the use of this automatic sear. So if you got the right extra parts, you could put them back in the gun and it's not that difficult to then convert it back into full auto. Uh, so from January 1st, 1963 onward, 
in order to be legally recognized as not machine guns, fouls had to have, basically had to have a bunch of metal left in the receiver so that that automatic sear couldn't be installed, at least not without a substantially larger amount of work. Now, what's interesting is in many cases when ATF makes a decision change like this, especially in more recent times, it will apply retroactively. And they will go through and they will find anything that had been imported uh, that was legal when it was imported but now violates the rules. They'll find that stuff and confiscate it. What they did with these is they actually specifically, and they, this is published in a letter to the Browning Company, they specifically said, we recognize that uh, 1,836 of these were imported according to our previous ruling, and we are going to continue to recognize those as not being machine guns. And they are, in, to this day, in the ATF's Curion Relic and NFA document, they're identified all by serial number. These are the 1,800 exempted, 1,836 exempted guns. Uh, and they also recognize them as Curio and Relic guns, which is kind of cool today. There are some places where uh, CNR status is necessary to legally own a firearm like this in a, one, just a couple states, I believe. At any rate, that is what makes these special. These are um, NFA-exempted Curio and Relic fouls that are as close as you will ever get to having an actual, original, fully FN-produced foul without it being an NFA item. There you have it. Fusil Automatique Légère, caliber 7.62. The selector lever has this little beak on it that hits on this peg and prevents you from rotating the selector any farther forward. Uh, although, you know, just grinding off that and moving the selector does not actually make this a machine gun. And then we have a marking on the right side of the upper receiver, uh, Fabrique Nationale d'Armes de Guerre, Herstal, Belgium, Belgique. These are called G-series fouls because they all fall in, well, basically all fall into the G-series, uh, G-prefix serial number range. Uh, this one is 869. The serial number is located here on the bottom of the receiver with the prefix, and also on the other side of the lower without the prefix. Uh, in addition to that, there are also a small number of GL series rifles um, that fall into this exemption. Um, and in fact, in addition to the 1,836 imported by Browning before the ruling changed, there are an additional 12 that were imported at some point in 1974 by what ATF describes as administrative error. Uh, and those are also on the exemption list. On the front of the receiver, we have the Belgian proof marks. And then all the other features you would expect from an early Belgian foul. There's the carry handle. Gorgeous wood grips. Uh, I believe some of these G-Series guns came in with plastic uh, handguards, some of them with wood. I think the wood is definitely the nicer looking. The Belgian metric pattern gas regulator there and adjustable front sight. And a long flash hider as opposed to the grenade launcher variants. Complete with bayonet lug on the bottom. So for someone who wants a foul and doesn't want to go through the NFA process, and by the way, even if you're willing to go through the NFA process for registration and transfer of a machine gun, finding a perfectly intact original Belgian foul isn't exactly trivial. Uh, a lot of them have been built up from parts kits, from various surplus, from different countries. This really is the cream of the crop for a foul because it's an early production, all original Belgian foul. Uh, and so the idea of being able to have that, and in fact, this is really a legitimate military firearm, even though it's semi-auto, because so many fouls were used by militaries in semi-auto only. So that's what makes this gun really particularly uh, desirable to serious foul collectors, is that it's as close as you'll ever get. Um, and in fact, it, it is, it's not just close, it is an original production FN foul. Uh, and the fact that it's Curion Relic eligible and exempted from the NFA is icing on the cake. And that's what results in these things having way higher prices and values than your standard off-the-rack DSA foul. So if you're looking for a shooter, this ain't it, because a lot of the value of this, or at least some of the value of this, comes from the fact that it is in pristine condition and hasn't been messed with. Now, this one has been fired. You can see some evidence of that on a few of the parts, but it's a beautiful rifle. So, if you need something like this for your own collection, of course, 
this one is up for sale. Uh, take a look at the description text below and you'll find a link to uh, Rock Island's catalog page for this rifle. And that has their pictures, description, price estimate, and a uh, link you can place a bit right through your web browser. Thanks for watching.